Well, we uh, we painted the wall. <laughs> it is a pretty strong color, isn't it? And it was a bit of a rash decision, but I'm sticking by it because I think it really complements the reddish orange tones on these little instruments that we like to play, don't you think? You know, I've been thinking a lot about how this little studio room has changed so much since Tabitha and I bought this house in Traveler's Rest about six, seven months ago. And it's been a fun transformation. Um, I was thinking back to that interview I did with John Reichman, how there was nothing in this room when I filmed that. It was just white walls. We've done so many videos here on the channel from this very spot since then. It's kind of crazy to think about and things have changed so much. If you guys are interested in seeing a full studio tour, let me know in the comments below because we'll have to make that happen. But I know if you clicked on this video, you're here for a different reason. <laughs> Improvisation on fiddle tunes is a big topic, right? And it's something that I think quite a lot about. I'm excited to share some of my thoughts here, but it's also a really popular topic. I think it might be one of the most frequently asked questions I get from people on the YouTube channel, from folks over on Patreon. It's, it's a good one. And I think it all really stems from this feeling of wanting to express ourselves better in context with the music that we're playing. And that gets to the heart of it. How can you play something that references the source material of the tune that you're improvising over? And I know there's a lot of different disparate opinions about how to improvise in a bluegrass context, but I think by and large, most people will tell you that you're supposed to play something around the original melody of the tune. And this is where bluegrass improvisation differs from jazz improv or other styles of music where you have multiple choruses to develop your ideas and explore this musical expression in a really expansive way. In bluegrass, especially bluegrass fiddle tunes, you usually only have 32 bars to play something and you want to make sure that it counts. And usually you can do that by referencing that source material like I was talking about. And of course the disclaimer is that there are a number of really famous bluegrass players out there who are known for not playing the melody in their solo, Tony Rice for instance. So you have permission to do whatever you want to, but if you want to develop the skill of being able to take the melody and use it as a vehicle for your own self-expression while you're improvising, then I've got a patent pending five-step process that will help you get there. And it's a five-step process that you can use over any fiddle tune to feel more confident improvising over it. But I will say it's really involved and it doesn't happen like that overnight. You're not gonna wake up and be an amazing improviser. But I promise if you take the time to go through these five steps, even over one tune, it's gonna revolutionize the way that you think and the way that you play over these tunes. Not only this one, but all the tunes that you play down the road because you're gonna understand the way that the music works way better. So I've teased you long enough though. Let's actually check out these five steps. And for our purposes in this video, we'll be using that tune, Whiskey Before Breakfast, an intermediate level bluegrass fiddle tune as our vehicle for all these different steps. If you don't know that one already, check out some of the other video lessons that we have on that same tune here on the channel up in the cards above. And the first step here is really obvious. We're just gonna learn the melody and learn the chords for the tune. We won't really spend much time here in this video, but of course this has to be the first step. Don't just learn it too, have it really well memorized and have it cemented in your fingers, not just the melody, but the chords as well, because that's gonna be the framework for everything that happens after this. Whenever you've got that down, let's move on to step number two, which is to learn that same melody in different places up and down the neck, even different octaves to give yourself more possibilities. And this is a really big step already, and it doesn't have a whole lot to do with improvisation, I know, but the analogy that I like to give is that we're kind of on this tightrope and we wanna build a melodic safety net underneath ourselves so that we can get back to the melody at the drop of a hat, no matter where we are up and down the fretboard. So for this melody, instead of just playing it in the first position like we usually do, you can also play it up the neck with your index finger on our root right here. You can also play the melody around your chop chord shape right here. You can even play the same melody in different octaves, right? If you wanted to leave no stone unturned, you could also play this melody with your middle finger on the root. Or even more challenging, if you wanted to use your pinky on the root here in closed position, So it takes a while, it's like hunting and pecking, seeing if you can take the melody that you know in the first position and translate it up the neck. But it's a super important skill because you're strengthening the bond between what you hear in your head and what you're able to play up and down the neck. And you can grab the tab and notation transcription for the melody here and all these different position and octave variations over on my Patreon page if you want to up here in the cards above. But I'd encourage you, if you already know the tune, the real value is to see if you can figure this stuff out on your own. We're gonna be using all these different octaves and positions as source 
material for steps later on. So make sure that you know these octaves and these different positions as well as you know the melody in the first position. All right, moving on to step number three here, which is transcribing a solo from one of your favorite mandolin players on this exact same tune. And this is a step that I put off doing for a long time because part of me was just overwhelmed at the thought of having to sit down with a recording and figure out a whole solo note by note, little by little, then memorizing it, working up to speed and all that stuff. And then another part of me just didn't want to be a clone copy of another mandolin player out there. I thought I could be my own person by not referencing any of the amazing mandolin playing that's come before me. And boy, was I ever wrong about that. <laughs> I think transcribing is one of the best ways to learn vocabulary on the instrument, right? You're getting inside the mind of an amazing player, seeing how they approach the fretboard and also how they approach improvising and developing a story in their solo over a tune like this. And the handy thing about lifting solos from really popular tunes like this is that you can, if you want to, copy and paste their ideas into your own playing, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's that saying that good artists borrow, but the best artists steal, and I think that's true for mandolin playing as well. And there's so many additional benefits to transcribing. Once you've got it learned and memorized and you can play along with the recording, you're also going to be soaking up all sorts of things about this player that you're playing along with. Their timing, their tone, their articulation, their dynamics, their eighth note feel, all these things kind of start becoming part of who you are as a player. And that's why it is important to transcribe a lot of different players so you can learn from a variety of different styles and figure out what you want to sound like as a mandolin player. And if you've never done this before, let me just walk you through my process real quick. What I usually do is just take that track that I'm learning from and import it into this program called the Amazing Slowdowner, which I have on my phone and my computer, and it allows me to change the speed of the recording without altering the pitch. So I just drop the speed down to like 40, 50% really slow and zero in on the time marks of where the solo is in the track and just start with the first note. And really all it is, like even after I've done this for a long time, it's still just hunting and pecking, right? You hear a note on the recording, you pause, you try to find that note on the fretboard, you hear the next note, you find that one, then you string bits and pieces together, you get a measure, you get a phrase, you get a section, until you have the entire solo before you. And I will say it can help to know a little music theory here. If you know the key of the song that you're transcribing and the corresponding scale, and if you know the arpeggios and the chord tones for all the different chords in the song, you can make more well-informed guesses about what the notes could be because you're eliminating any periphery notes that don't belong. And the other caveat is that transcribing doesn't always mean that you have to write it down. You can if you want to use tablature or notation, but honestly, what I like to do is just learn it by ear and memorize it as I go along, because the end goal is to have this solo internalized as well as the melody and the different positions and different octaves that we learned so far. And there's this really magical thing that happens once you've got the solo memorized and you can play it with a track up to speed. It almost sounds like there's just one mandolin being played because you can match the phrasing, the time, the dynamics, the tone of that player so well. And that's when you know you really have the solo down. <laughs> it's a great feeling. I'm excited for you to have it. So go check out one of your favorite recordings of Whiskey Before Breakfast and get to transcribing. <laughs> All right, so when we get to step four here, this is where we start shifting from taking in ideas from the melody and from other players' work on this tune to start coming up with our own ideas. And the idea is to lean on our experience from learning the melody and chords, from learning the different octaves and positions for the melody and transcribing that other player's solo. And now we're gonna mix and match those different elements together to write our own solo for this tune. This is kind of an interesting topic because I used to think that professional players never did this, that it was almost taboo to write your own solo for a tune until I heard Noam Bikilny, banjo player with the Punch Brothers, say that he learned how to improvise by writing five solos for Whiskey Before Breakfast. Funny enough, I actually took his advice to heart and I came up with my own five solos for Whiskey Before Breakfast and uh, you can see what I came up with here in this video and the cards above. And once you have that solo written and memorized, of course, you can play it note for note at the jam and that's totally cool. There's no shame in doing that, but the hope is that you can also use it as a jumping off point and seeing what happened, trusting that your fingers are gonna know what to do a lot better now that you put in all this work in advance. But it is kind of a scary endeavor writing your own solo and I still struggle with this imposter syndrome that I'm not good enough or that everything I write is just rubbish and I end up banging my head against the wall for hours and hours still stuck on the first phrase. So I try to encourage folks by saying that every solo that you write is gonna be a good solo because it's gonna get you to the next solo that you write. <laughs> the idea is that every time you sit down to write a solo, you're gonna learn and you're gonna make these tiny micro improvements and all these different elements that go into writing a solo. So 
once you've done this a hundred times, it's gonna be a lot easier and gonna be a lot better, but you have to actually do it to get better at it. <laughs> First time I did this, I actually had to get a piece of paper, write out 32 measures, all the different core changes above each corresponding measure, and write out note by note what I wanted, because otherwise I couldn't really contain the form of the song in my head. And that might be a good place to start because you can see the form and structure of the tune laid out really clearly before you. You can see where the chord changes happen and how your note choices line up with them. You can see where the melody Melody should be and how you can intersect that melody at different points throughout your solo as well. And then I usually just follow my notes. You know, maybe I'll start with the melody and find a way of transitioning to a different octave or a different position. Maybe I'll use some different device like cross picking or double stops or tremolo. It's all fair game. And you just gotta hack away at it until it's done and you have it memorized and you can play it up to tempo. And that brings us to step number five, which is to put it bluntly, forget all of that stuff and just try improvising. <laughs> you know, there's a great quote from Charlie Parker that I love and that a lot of people mention when talking about this topic. It goes like this, he says, you've got to learn your instrument, then you practice, practice, practice. And then when you finally get up there on the bandstand, forget all of that and just wail. I can speak from experience that there's a lot of truth to that. Whenever I'm improvising and start over analyzing things or thinking too much, that's when I usually play the worst. And I usually just have to forget everything and just follow my ear, trusting in all that practice that I put in in the first four steps here. But it is kind of a separate skill, being spontaneous and improvising something new in the moment. And it's something that you have to really work at. Just like everything else in music, if you don't practice improvising, you're probably not gonna get that much better at it. But if you haven't actually spent the time with your instrument, figuring out things like the melody, the different positions of the melody, transcribing, writing your own solos, that you won't really have much vocabulary to draw from in the moment when it's time to improvise. But like I mentioned, it's a super involved process. You don't become a great improviser overnight by following these five steps. And there's so many different facets of improvising. We didn't even talk much about the theoretical side of things like the scales, the scale patterns, and the arpeggios, exercises, and stuff like that, which are also really valuable when it comes to improvising. But at least in a bluegrass context, I think it does help to start with the melody as your main focus is first, learn those different octaves, different positions, combine them together in different ways. And then on top of that, by transcribing a solo from another player, you're gonna see how a great musician handles the melody, treats it, changes it as they go along in their solo, and you're gonna have better ideas for your own solos later on. So I can promise you by following these five steps, you're gonna become a better fiddle tune improviser in the long run. <laughs> so I hope this is helpful, but I know we're talking in really broad strokes right here. And to be honest, I don't follow all five of these steps for every tune that I learn because that would take forever. But even having done this for a number of fiddle tunes, it's really given me a whole new level of confidence when improvising at the jam. So if you wanna get a head start on completing these five steps for whiskey before breakfast, you can grab the transcription with the tab and notation for the melody, for the different position and octave variations of the melody, as well as those five solos that I wrote for this tune all over on my Patreon page at the link in the description below here. You can also grab the MP3 backing tracks that we've recorded for this tune, which I think are really useful tools to use when improvising. And hey, I'd love to hear from you. If you have any other thoughts or tips on how to improvise over bluegrass fiddle tunes, be sure to leave a comment below. And if you learned something, if you enjoyed this video, I'd be so grateful for a like and a subscribe here on YouTube. It goes a long way to making these videos possible. And there's lots more videos coming your way soon. So I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.